cool. So, uh, yeah, Cairo. So thank you for making time to uh, chat with me today. You know, I don't know if you uh, know, my name is Dave Schiffman and I write for Root Fire. Uh, we're an a organization here in the United States that helps uh, promote reggae music. Yeah. So thanks for cutting out some, some time out of your day to, uh, to spend with me online. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. My pleasure. Yeah, right on. So uh, I have to tell you, man, um, I'm really stoked to uh, speak with you. And when I heard your EP, you know, the Easy Now EP, I was just blown away. And then I found <laughs> out like you were 12 and I was like, what? I'm like, I got to talk to this kid, man. So uh, it's a great album, man. I, you should be very proud of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so I'm not going to take up too much of your time. I'm sure you got things to do like homework or whatever, <laughs> maybe write more songs, but uh figured, you know, I just wanted to uh, speak to you a little bit and let Root Fire uh, followers, you know, learn a little bit about you and help promote this awesome album. So, for sure. Thanks for the opportunity, you know? Yeah, man, sure. So, um, you know, I did a little research about you um, and, you know, I, I learned that, um you know, that you grew up, or I should say you are growing up in uh, Toronto, because you still got a ways to go yet, right? You still got a ways to go yet. Uh, but you're growing up in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, your father's Jamaican. Uh, your your mother's Canadian. Yeah. And, uh, one of the things that I read that, I, that really uh, kind of gave me chills, you know, was that uh, one of your earliest memories of reggae music is that your father would take you to daycare on his bicycle. And you would listen to reggae music. Is that is that uh, am I am I saying that correctly? Yeah, we would and, sing along together with the songs on that he had on his phone, and we would be riding and we be singing "Steer It Up." And I'm in the little the little gray bicycle seat in the back. <laughs> that's awesome. That is awesome. Uh, you know, I I know from like the music that I grew up on. I I didn't have parents cool enough to introduce me to reggae music. But, um, you know, I listened to uh, the music that they that they were listening to when I was a kid, and, I, and that music will always stick with me. So I'm curious if you think your love of reggae music really comes from the fact that, you know, you grew up on it, or are there things about the music in particular that really speak to you? Well, it's a two, it's a, it's a, like, a, it's, so it's half and half. I grew up on reggae music, so I'm going to find love for it, even if it's like my second favorite music and my third favorite music. But then again, uh, I love the bass and I love the drums. And those are some of my favorite instruments. And they just so happen to be the main instruments in reggae. If there's bass and drums, you can play reggae music, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I hope you don't mind. I want to ask you a question. Sure. If if you didn't grow up listening to reggae music, how were you introduced? So that's a great question because uh, it was something I was going to speak to you about. Um, I just happened to stumble <laughs> upon reggae music when I was in high school, and which is a long time ago now, Cairo. That was like 30 something years ago, okay? And wow. uh, I, was, I was just, I, I, uh, a cassette tape just fell into my lap. And on one side, it had Bob Marley. And on the other side, it had Peter Tosh. <laughs> and I was instantly just drawn into this music. I had never heard anything like it. I didn't know much about it, but it, I was so interested in it. It prompted me to like research all I could about reggae music. And let me tell you something, my friend, this was a long time ago before the internet, if you can imagine that. <laughs> so when, when I say research, I had to like go to the library and like take out books and stuff like that. You know, like I couldn't just go online on my phone. Um, yeah. But yeah, and, and so what I was gonna say to you is what's cool about this is like, so reggae music's not the kind of music that the average person is familiar with. No, it's right? not. Usually they have to have someone that introduces them to reggae music or, you know, they're, they usually, because when I do a lot of interviews, I always say like, how did you discover reggae music? How did reggae come into your life? Because it's not like something that you're just going to, that every person, like you're going to hear it on the radio or whatever. So there's usually, everybody always has a story about how they first listened to reggae music. That's correct. And, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So this, this leads me to ask you something, what I'm really curious about. So you're, you're, are you 12, 13? How old are you? Mm, okay, so I'm 12 right now, but as of July 15, I will be 13. 
Yeah, 13. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you're you're 12 years old. I'm curious about your friends. I, I My guess is that if it wasn't for you, your friends would not even know what reggae music is, and they still may not. Like, I'm curious, do you... Do they know about like what you're up to recording an album and doing all this cool stuff? Um, okay, so only the it, only my inside inside friends know what I'm up to. And like mostly the inside friends that I have are mostly more like um Caribbean descent of Caribbean descent. Okay. Uh some of my older friends from my old schools and whatnot, they 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 know that I was into reggae, but they didn't know that they didn't know that I would take it to this extent, you know. Okay, cool. Yeah, I guess if if they're growing up with uh, with Caribbean descent, then they definitely have a much more better opportunity to know reggae music. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Growing up with it, you know, as opposed to like your average Canadian, perhaps who who you know just doesn't have that those those roots, you know. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so I, I uh, had read that, you know, you come from a large family. You have, I think, what, five other siblings? Yes, that's correct. And five, uh, I have three brothers, two sisters. Okay. Yeah, it's a big family. And so, uh, but you're the only one really that's, that's pursuing um, music as a career, right? Yeah, I'm sure some of them had dreams of music when they were younger and whatnot. But, you know, things work out the way they work out sometimes. That's, that's true. Yeah, that's right. So I'm curious. So, okay, so you're 12 years old, and you you started putting together this album. I believe was it about approximately back like in November, last November. Uh, something of some something of that matter. November, December. Okay. It's it's not really too clear in my memory right now. <laughs> okay, no, not important, man. So, um, when when was like the first time where you like decided that you wanted to actually put an album together or, or actually produce music. Like I, I read that, you know, you've always been singing since you were a little kid and you, your dad was in a band. So you grew up around a lot of musicians that were always in the house. So you've been, and your parents are both musicians. So you're, you're immersed in music. Uh, but when did you decide that you yourself wanted to start making music? Like, was it right before this album or was it a little bit farther, like before that? And then you were looking for ways to go about it. Um, well, I've always loved playing music live. You'd be surprised, actually. The opportunity to make this this album actually kind of was, it was kind of presented to me. I didn't really, like, how do I explain it? I didn't really pursue it to say, okay, I'm going to record this album and that's my goal and that's what I'm going to do. It was kind of more like, okay, here, do you want to record an album? So we were trying to join a band at the studio we were working at and the band kind of fell apart, right? And the studio owner said, you know, I like your voice. Let's record an uh, EP. And I wasn't going to turn that opportunity down. <laughs> that's a, that's right, a perfect that's opportunity. Right. So, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> from there, things kind of worked out like that. And we just keep rolling ever since. Right on, man. Right on. That's, that's great. Yeah, that's right. You're not going to turn that opportunity down for sure. <laughs> so, um. Okay, and so I believe that the studio owner that uh, he had introduced you to the producer, Tim, Tim Dubs? Yes, Tim Dubs. Okay. The studio owner's name is Willow. Willow, right. And um, could you just talk a little bit about the, the process of making the album? I believe you're, you and your father and Tim collaborated together. I, I think from what I read, uh, one of the tracks, uh, Easy Now, was was already like kind of put together by Tim, but then you helped kind of you know tweak it a little bit. But the other three songs... Uh, you know, you you really basically wrote along, I guess, with your father and Tim. Could you just talk a little bit about like that process, how the songs came came together? Um, okay, so fear. Uh, I was trying to play. Actually, I was trying to figure out how to play the baseline for Fear by Winston McDonough. And that baseline is crazy hard. It's like 10 notes in one bar. Uh, oh my gosh. Hold on. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. Mom, bad timing. <laughs> I'm on. All right. After a few technical difficulties, we're back here with Cairo. <laughs> <laughs> so you were talking about writing the song Fear and you were talking about Winston McEnough's uh, bass line. Yeah. So like I was saying, that bass line is crazy hard to play. And um, I ended up just simplifying it and it became... Dun, 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 
Dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, And when we went to the studio to present that to Willow, he was saying, um, he was saying, okay, the lyrics are good and we could record this. Tim said, no, let's change up the lyrics, all original songs for this one. So we ended up, instead of it becoming um, fear, 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 wanted to leave our mind, it became fear, 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 fear in the yard of the people. So, <laughs> so it, it changed up, well, not really drastically, but the, the core parts of it remained the same, but the rest changed. So that's how fear was recorded. Easy Now was more of a collaboration where we would all sit in the studio and we would say, we would say, um, easy peasy, the man squeezy. What's next? Tim would say, walking down the hall, so nice and breezy. I'd be like, okay, yeah, that's good. Dad would say, thinking about my macaroni, so nice and cheesy and whatnot. And it went on from there, you know. But Easy Now, Easy Now really started off as a freestyle. And the original to Easy Now is easy peasy. That man squeezy, walking down the hall, so nice and breezy. Thinking about me, my curly, so nice and cheesy. When we sight the bully, we name Stevie. Yeah, them can't touch me, and then they can't reach me. Bobby, Bobby, and I'm telling you to release me. They're moving too big, and they're moving too sleazy. Me telling you back up because they're moving too cheesy. It's, 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 some of the words are changed, but they, we wanted to keep it more to the point of bullying. So we had to, change up the the little parts needed to be tweaked like bobby bobby line telling you to really see and whatnot um that's pretty killer that that the song is you know and honestly i didn't even really make that connection um that it was about bullying can you speak to that for a for a moment oh yeah, yeah, yeah. um okay so the the breakdown of the song is easy peasy lemon squeezy walking down the hall so nice and breezy so I'm walking in the school in the um in, down the hallway, minding my own business, not worrying about no one, thinking about my lunch, macaroni, nice and cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> and then from the corner of my eye, I see a bully. His name is Stevie. Then he he hits my friend's lunch out of his hands. His name is Cleavy. And then as I walk up, they start to get physical. And then he wants to come and target me. And that's why I say. And one move big and in one try tease me because he was trying to go after me since I tried to stand up to him. And then I tell him back off because he's moving too sweetly. Right on. <laughs> and well, that, then. I'm, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you can continue. The rest of the song is more about coronavirus and people trying to make money, even though things are being shut down. And then the last verse of the song is about uh, gun violence. So it's like a, a triple bass song. It covers all the bases. Well, yeah. all four bases. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of messages in one song for sure. And it's funny because, I mean, I've listened to it a lot. I was just at, before we did this interview, I was out just riding my bike and I was cranking your LP, I mean, your EP. And like, it's just, I get, I get, just hearing you sing it, I get like chills, man, because <laughs> you have such a great, it's such a killer flow, you know, Thank like you. your lyrical delivery is just on point and it's just so special. And it's really what, I mean, the music is great in this album. I mean, it's just, a, it's just a fantastic album, but obviously what really makes it soar is your, is your vocal delivery. So I'm curious. Thank you so um, much. You're welcome. I'm curious though, is there, I, so a couple of things I wanted to ask you, I had read that you this is going to be a two-part question okay Cairo all right so I had read that you've done like a lot of research you know on reggae music and all the different sub-genres you know like ska and rock steady and what have you so I'm curious um you know what what your research includes is it just listening to music or is it does it go beyond that and the other part of the question is uh who do you think this is pertaining to your vocals and your delivery do you model your vocal delivery after a particular singer or do you think it sounds like anybody? I'm just curious. Okay. So to answer the first question about my research and whatnot, the, the research that I do is not necessarily like super duper sit in my room till two in the morning looking at, at different artists and whatnot. It's more 
Well, it is kind of like that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I do like to I do like to sit in my room and research different artists and and random facts that nobody really needs to know about these artists. <laughs> like, did you did you know that Gregory Isaacs used to play guitar? I I honestly didn't know that. Did you know that Dennis Brown used to stand on Heineken boxes and sing, and that's why his nickname is the Boy Wonder? I certainly did not know that. Did you know that Bob Marley plays a 1972 reissue Les Paul Special Junior in uh, Mahogany Finish? So you're like a walking reggae <laughs> encyclopedia. I try to be, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and you're dropping names that I'm pretty sure like 0.002% of the 12 year olds on earth know who <laughs> Brown and Gregory Isaacs are like two of my favorite musicians, of course, Bob Marley, but he's a little bit more well known, right? But yes. The fact that you're like dropping facts about Gregory Isaacs, the cool ruler, just gives me chills because man, he's like, he's one of my favorite performers, you know? Yeah. But great, man. That's that's so cool. So, okay. So regarding your vocal delivery, I mean, have you, did you model it after anybody or, or it just comes like the way it comes is just natural, but who do you, like, do you think it sounds like anybody? Um, all right. So when I was younger, I used to try so hard to get my voice to sound just like Bob Marley's. And one day my dad pulled me aside and said, listen, don't ever try and copy someone else's voice. Who do you like? And I said, I like Dennis Brown. I like Bob Marley. I like Gregory Isaacs. I like Sugar Mine It. And then my dad said, so blend them. And that's, that's, what, I, that's what I did. In some of the songs on the EP, I sound, well, I think I sound like Dennis Brown more than anyone. And some of them, I sound like Gregory Isaacs. And, <laughs> you know, I try not to. Even though I I I I I I can and I shouldn't. <laughs> well, it's okay. I, I mean, you're you're channeling that with because that's what you listen to. And it, it, I can I can do uncanny impressions of both of them. Oh yeah. I can do Dennis Brown. Uh, Dennis Brown would say, "Girl, your love is like we're fire spreading all over the world." Look. It. I said you were roses many times. And Gregory Isaacs would say, um, don't you want to I want you and never to my aunt. Thank you. <laughs> you know? That's so awesome. <laughs> Oh man, could you do Ika Mouse? Uh Ika Mouse says, Emo mommy, mo mommy, mo mommy, mo ma. Anybody, baby, 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 honey. Y'all know she grow me with the papa. Anybody, baby, 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 honey. Me only have one big sister and then give me brother pie, you know? Dude, I could do this with you all night long. I could do this with you all night long. It's amazing. Oh my God. Great job. That's that's so killer. So, but Thank that's you. that's really a great advice from your father. Um, really like sound advice. You know, it's nice to have uh, a mentor like that. Is there anyone else um in your life uh, that served as a, a mentor for you, a musical mentor, uh, besides your father? Uh okay, yeah. Well, there's, there's plenty of people who I've met along the way that have given me great advice. Like, my one of the people who I used to play in a band with, Uncle, Uncle Jay, that's what I call him, but his name is Junior Miller. Um, he was the one who really got me into, like, trying to learn how to play the acoustic guitar rather than the electric guitar. Because when you play the acoustic guitar, you're bad, 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 you know? Everyone wants to hear you play the acoustic guitar, not necessarily the electric guitar. If you mess up on the electric guitar, that's it for you. Everyone's going to say, no, nah, you can't play guitar. But on the acoustic guitar, it's more like a, a brush off the shoulder thing. Okay, I'm just going to continue on. Um, sorry. Um, that's okay. And then Uncle Willow, he really taught me how studio work really happens and the process of it and whatnot. I used to think that studio work was just going to the studio, sing ribbit, ribbit, pie, 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 and then come out. But, oh my gosh, is it a long process, <laughs> you know? So and you know what, it's, it's perfect that you're saying this because I, that was actually gonna be my next question. So I'll say it and let you continue with what the direction you're headed. But basically I was curious, in your opinion, what was the most challenging part of cutting the record? 
but you know was actually the song i'll tell you in a second if i could just remember this the song that i had the most trouble recording with i could say is fear because with fear there's a lot of high notes that need to be controlled in a sense they're gonna say what is this insanity taking over humanity too much focus on vanity, but you the fuck. Ja, will let me see the clarity. That was hard to do in in more of a, because the key of the song was higher than what I'm singing. So that was a little bit hard for me to do, especially hours in the studio where my voice is cracking and whatnot, and I'm trying to catch my breath and the, the booth is hot. That was that was just not a good a good look for me. I don't know. I got you. Yeah, it was it was grueling, and maybe you were starting to like peter out, you know, losing your steam and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And you probably have to take advantage of the thing with the studio is like you got to make the most of your time when you're there because in that business, like time is money, right? So yeah, you know, you gotta you gotta get stuff done while you can. <laughs> it's not maybe you're not feeling good that day, but it does you got to bring it nonetheless, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I get it, man. Well, that's 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 pretty interesting. Um, I'm curious if, um, you know, you uh, have a favorite song out of the four on the EP. Yes, my favorite song is Rise Again. And it's not for the reason that you would think. It's not necessarily the drummer, the bass, or the, the guitar. It's actually because I love the harmony that, that Josh Goldman, my guitarist, does. He, he did um, two-level harmony, and then I did the highest level. And it blended so nice. And I just love the harmony on that, on that song. I feel like uh, that song is probably the most, you know, most, most roots reggae oriented. Yes. Um, and, uh, but uh, I, it's hard to say, it's hard for me to pick a favorite because I love all, all four of them. <laughs> and the only thing I don't like about the EP is that there's only four songs. So uh, I'm hoping, uh, I think I read that you're, you're working on some more music and maybe hoping the, uh, planning on dropping a full LP by the end of the year or something like that. Um, we're hoping, we're hoping something like that. We have a couple more songs in the tank. Some of them have been recorded, but not really mixed or mastered yet. Some of them I have written on pieces of paper that go in my notebook and, and sit and collect dust until this time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. some of them I have in, in, in notes on my phone. So we, we have we have a couple of them to do still. We're we're coming. We're coming. Yeah. So people the creative the cre what's that? People just be patient. Okay, yeah, I'll be patient. Well, I'll, we'll tell the masses to be to be uh patient. But uh so I hear you got like bits and you know, you're always creating, you're always thinking about new songs, but it takes time for these things to come to fruition, whether it be your creative process or the stu getting the studio and getting, you know, the, the people together that need to be part of the recording process. So it all takes time. Um, but I do understand too, that like, you know, you can't just sit there and like write a bunch of songs all like in a row. It takes time for you to think about no. things and for the, you know, for your, for your muse to, uh, to inspire you, right? Well, you can write a bunch of songs all in a row. Maybe the first one will be good. <laughs> but the rest of them is not going to be guaranteed to be good. You could be writing, you could be writing songs that people will only listen to once, as my uncle Jomo calls them, grocery market songs that only last two weeks, <laughs> and they come out like, 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 um, well, they come out like like bad songs. That's yeah, that's how like they would come out. Like, which is unfortunately a lot of what we hear on the radio these days, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Grocery market songs? Yeah, just a lot of crap, in my, <laughs> in my opinion. But uh, so kind of going back to the recording process, we, we sort of touched upon this. Uh, well, you, you talked about what was the most uh, challenging for you. But I'm yeah. curious, what stands out as something you learned during the process of recording the album and and how will it affect your future recording sessions? Uh, well, I've learned well. Two, I've learned plenty of things from recording things from the sorry from the recording session, but two of them really stand out to me. One, even though it's so generic, people always say this all the time, but it's really, really true. Practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. 
I totally overestimated my guitar abilities going into the studio. And I had to learn the hard way that if I don't practice, I'm not going to get any better. You know? Yeah. I was thinking the level that I'm at is good, but you can always improve. Always, always keep improving. The day that you stop learning is the day that you die. You know? That's true. And the second one, the second lesson that I learned is never overestimate your vocal capabilities as well. <laughs> because like I because like I said um earlier in the interview, my voice was cracking in the studio. I was trying to drink water to keep it at bay. It would and sometimes I had to take 15 minute breaks to let my vocal cords recuperate for a little, you know, until I yeah. jump back on it again. Uh-huh. Uh but you know due to modern technology that stuff didn't really come through you know on the recordings yeah and i'm i'm glad tim's a really good producer and i thank him for that a lot but um yeah those are the two things that you should always remember practice and never overestimate yourself that's great that's great never overestimate yourself and and probably don't underestimate yourself either right no don't underestimate yourself yeah. never underestimate yourself those are the two things. Keep moderate. Make sure you don't become egotistic about your abilities, but don't, when you know you can do something at a, a pretty high level, never sit at the sidelines. Always show people what you can do, you know? Yeah. Never let people say, oh, this guy can't do this and this guy can't do that. He's not good. Go in there and do your thing, you know? Amen. I love that. I love that uh, thinking. So I just got a couple more uh, questions for you uh, and I'll let you uh, get on with your evening. But um, so I'm curious, I know like we've been in this pandemic for over a year, so there really hasn't been uh, too many opportunities for live performances, but I'm curious what your experience is in performing in front of people. And uh, now the things, well, I don't know how, if they're, how they are in Canada right now with the pandemic, but here in the United States, a lot of opportunities for live music are starting to come around again. Things are starting to open back up. So I'm curious yeah. if you have anything planned, um, you know, for, for, for upcoming performances anywhere. Um, the first question was what? Uh, what do I feel about? First part of the oh question was like, have you have you performed in the past in front of people? Hold on. I'm, I'm so sorry. Once no again. Problem. No problem. I'll pause it. <laughs> My oh, no it's all good, man. It's all good. All right, let's get back to it. So after after right, a back second, on it. Uh, pause, yeah, we're back. We're recording again. So um, what was I asking? Oh, yeah, I was curious. Have you performed in front of people previously? Oh, yes. Um, I've performed a good number of times, maybe 20 times in my in my music career. But the two that stand up are Jambana 2016 and Rastafest 2017. Uh, those are Torontonian festivals. I, I think Reggae, I think uh, Reggae Fest, um, Rastafest, sorry, is more international though. I think that's where they send it all over the place to be broadcasted. But I know for her fact, Jambana is more a Torontonian festival, but I managed to perform on both of them. Uh, Jambana when I was six, Rastafest when I was about seven what? or eight. <laughs> and, um, That's uh, amazing. so you you've been performing since you like in front of people since you were six or seven. Yeah, uh, yes, just about. And I, I'm assuming at that point, were you just singing, or were you also playing any sort of instrument? Um, I was playing, I was playing the drums, not necessarily live, but I could played them if one asked me to oh okay obviously but... not to obviously not to my standards now because i was six and seven yeah. but um i mean i, I could play them but you when know? you performed you were just, you were singing yes i was just singing okay i got you and then um so and do you have anything planned uh upcoming performances uh, i'm gonna guess no just because of the pandemic or tell me if i'm wrong okay well you'd be surprised um we have, we have one bullet in the chamber oh, yeah? and we're just waiting for the right opportunity. Uh, it's a little bit of a live performance. Like, 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 um, not, not live as in, in front of people, but I mean like live 
as in live streamed performance. Okay. And we're going to try and get that prepared for people before my birthday. So it's going to be like a birthday bash performance. And um, everyone get excited, you know. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm getting excited for that. I guess that'll be over the summer then because it, didn't you mention your birthday's in July? Yes, my, my birthday is July 15th. Okay, so that's something to look forward to. I'll be sure to try to catch that stream. <laughs> Hopefully so, you do. Here, here's another question for you, Cairo. And this is, this is uh, I like, I'm curious, I, and I, I get the sense from speaking to you that you do, but are you starting to realize the power that you yield as a musician? You know, the, the ability to convey messages to people, influence people, motivate people. This is like being a musician and having that, vo not only that singing voice, but that voice to convey these messages is not something to take lightly. Are you like, is that starting to like, are you starting to get that? <laughs> um, yeah, yes, uh, I am. I mean, it's a, it's a start. We're trying to get the message out to the people to live upright and, you know, live a conscious lifestyle. But if I'm, if I'm going to be honest, everyone has the power to do so. Everyone has the power to speak up about injustice. Everyone has the power to stand up for what they know is right. Everyone has the power. It's in everyone. Anyone, if you put your mind to it, you'll be able to do whatever you like, you know? That's if, right. If that's, if that's, if you're a veterinarian, if you're a, if you're an astronaut, if you're a doctor, you can, you, you can stand up for your, or whatever you think is, is not right, you know? So don't let what you do or what you think you can't do stop you. Always go and try for it, you know? That's right. I don't know. Uh, you may or may not be a fan of hockey, but I always think of uh, Wayne Gretzky's uh, quote, you know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't shots take. You don't, yeah. yeah, you don't take, yeah. You know? That's it, <laughs> It's man. true. That's yeah, I know. It's it's always like a good motivator for me when I when I when I'm thinking of like if I'm procrastinating or I'm like, oh, I don't know if I should even bother. I always think about that. It's like you 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 know you gotta take a chance. If you don't take the chance, it ain't gonna happen, you know? <laughs> yeah, so. you're right. Awesome. Well, listen, buddy, thank you again for making time. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you. And hopefully this won't no be problem. Uh, the last time that I interview you. Maybe maybe we'll do a, do something again, uh, you know, when you got some, some more music coming out. That'd be my pleasure. All right, brother. Have a good evening. It's good to meet you. You as well. All right. Be well. You as well. Take care.